Good morning once again. The Lord be with you. Thank you so much. This morning our gospel text comes to us from the gospel according to St. Mark chapter 1. And we will read and hear together verses 29 through 39. Mark 1, 29 through 39. If you'd like to follow along in your pew Bible, you can find this on New Testament page 33. Mark 1, 29 through 39. And here's what it says. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now, Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons and He would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place where he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. He answered, let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. For those of you who have been present Following along in recent weeks, you know that we have just come through a sermon series entitled 72 Plus You, based upon the eponymous initiative of the Memphis and Tennessee annual conferences. And as we heard time and again in those sermons, the program is a call to action, a call to action that's based upon Four verbs, a call to, by God's leading, discover and equip and connect and send lay and clergy leaders who will transform congregations such that they offer Christ to a hurting world, one neighborhood at a time. And we will continue to to hear about and and think about and work through these things moving forward. But I begin with this sort of recap today because in some sense, this morning's prescribed scripture readings are also themselves calls to action. More specifically, they are calls to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, which is a call that all of us, in some form, in some shape, in some way, bear. This week's gospel lesson picks up where last week's left off. Jesus is still in the region of Capernaum. As a matter of fact, he's leaving the synagogue where last Sunday we heard about him casting an unclean spirit. Out of a man. And here, as he travels with some of his disciples, we again see Jesus coming upon those who are unwell, healing them. St. Mark says all who were sick or, or, or possessed with demons were brought to him, which I don't know, it sounds to me as if there were a vast number who were suffering. In myriad ways. The whole city was gathered. The evangelist writes. It reads like the whole place. The whole place was in a desperate condition. 
it seems as if their need for Jesus was particularly great. And yet, in the midst of all of this chaos, in the midst of all of this clamor, there is the story of one. The story of an individual who is singled out in what she receives from Christ. Hers hers might be a story that's easy to overlook given the amount of other healings that Jesus performed in this vicinity. It might be easy to overlook given that the woman portrayed is nameless, known only to us as Simon Peter's mother-in-law. Indeed, we're not given much to go on at all. Not much specific information about her, only that she is fevered and in bed. Two verses. That's all the attention she gets. But I think that today she deserves our full focus. This story, her story is not one to gloss over because it has much to say if we'll listen. The scripture tells us that Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. Indeed, it says that he lifted her up. I don't know about you, but as I read this, I find that this image by itself is a beautiful thing. Christ reaching out to and and taking this ailing person by the hand and helping her to her feet. It's an image of Christ that ought to be familiar to us. I hope it's familiar for us because many of us can attest to the fact that though we have experienced trials that have knocked us down, we have also experienced a Savior who has picked us up. Has anyone here known Jesus to be a healing Savior? We know a God who, as the psalmist writes, lifts up the downtrodden. And this is a lovely picture indeed. Even so, something is lost in the English as we read the gospel. Because the Greek word that's used in speaking about Jesus' healing of Peter's mother-in-law is egeron. Which does mean to lift. It does mean to raise. But not just in the sense of sitting or standing up. Because it's the same word that's used in all of the gospel passages that speak about the resurrection of Christ. And that puts an entirely different spin on what's happening here, doesn't it? It puts a whole new light on what it is that Peter's mother-in-law received because the lifting up of this woman wasn't just a, a lifting of her natural self out of a bed. This is Igeron. This is a resurrection moment. Not that she was physically deceased and and Jesus brought her to life, but that she received from Jesus as Jesus reached out to her newness of life. Transformation of life. She was brought from death to life in the sense that her encounter with Jesus transformed her. It made her something else, someone else, a new creation, as the apostle might say. And we see this in her response. When Jesus lifts her up, she doesn't say, well, gee, thanks, I sure appreciate it. 
Nice to see you. No, as Jesus lifted her up, she immediately began to serve. She was made well. And she got to work straight away. Now, some might shrug this off as no big deal. Ah, she was just doing what, what any person with, with guests in their home would do. And I don't know, maybe there is some truth to that. But as I take a look, I see something a bit more profound here because I see in this woman's actions a recognition of what had been done for her and the ensuing desire to pay it forward. Because you see, Mark uses the word serve, which in the ancient tongues is diakonia, from which we get our word deacon. It's a term that refers to servant ministry, a ministry that is self-effacing and seeks to meet the needs of others. The scripture doesn't describe how she served or in precisely what capacity she served, but we know that, we know that as Christ raised her to new life, she became a servant. And friends, truly, is this not what the gospel demands? Isn't this what's expected of each of us as we are altered by God in Christ? Now we, we too, we, we speak of being made new of having passed by the grace of God from death to life that which John Wesley referred to as the new birth. Now we speak of being raised up from various afflictions and addictions and torments to live in Christ Jesus. And we offer God thanks when we are rescued. But how often do we consider in full the implications of having been lifted up by Christ. How frequently do we give attention to what the resurrecting, the, the life-giving Christ calls us to? How readily do we acknowledge that the reason we are rescued, the reason we are changed by God is to live for God. Which means loving and serving both God and those around us. Yet this is precisely what Christ models for us in today's gospel lesson. He shows us what life in him looks like. It necessitates our going forth. To wherever we find those who are broken and doing what Jesus did, proclaim the message. We are to proclaim the message, the evangel of God's kingdom to all who need to hear. And yes, this proclamation means that we, that we tell people with our words, with what we say, in whom we place our trust and why. It means that we confess with our lips our faith that through Christ, God has reconciled all things to God's self. But, but, notice that Jesus' ministry was not devoted entirely or solely to speaking. Jesus preached and Jesus taught and so proclaimed the gospel. But he also proclaimed the gospel in his deeds, in what he did. Jesus came to the ailing woman. Jesus took 
her hand. Jesus lifted her up. Those are all action words. And so is the woman's response. She served. St. Paul reinforces this notion in what he writes to the Corinthians, saying that he is obligated to proclaim the gospel. But he also says that to do this, he made himself a servant, a slave of all, so that he might win more of those whom he met. The apostle is saying that to be a follower of Christ means becoming all things to all people that even a few might be saved. It means recognizing where people are at and ministering to them there. But note that he says this is what he became. This is what he became. This is not what he had previously been. It's what he was made into as he encountered and gave himself to Christ. There was a change in the life of the man who'd been known as Saul. A change which manifested itself in him giving his life for the sake of the gospel. When that change occurred, Paul responded. And he too responded with service. Friends, I want you to hear this. Christ visited that woman who lay ill on her bed. He touched her. And in so doing, he did more than restore her physical well-being. He imparted to her a desire to show forth the same grace that she had been shown. He gave her the desire to serve as she had been served. This is what a life truly lifted up looks like. I wonder, have we too experienced the resurrecting power of Christ? Have we known what it means to find new and abundant life? Has he come to us where we are and taken us by the hand and lifted us up? If so, we ought to know that that is not where our story ends. That is where our story begins. Because we are made whole to offer that same wholeness to our neighbor. We are given life that we might speak life to others. How might we, here, in this church, as part of this congregation, how might we become a more visible presence in our community? What might we do To have a greater impact on the lives of those around us. In what ways can we be more intentional in our disciple making? The prophet Isaiah writes that God gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Indeed, that God heals the brokenhearted. And binds up their wounds. God brings this to us. That we might help to bring it. To those around us. We are made well. That we might rise. And serve. May it be so. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, 
and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.